see, uh, this is me, or this is rather my old Far Cropper character. <laughs> now, you might ask, is that a character? I mean, uh, hands up anyone who's seen The Muppet Show. Okay, not, ev not everybody has seen The Muppet Show. Uh, is a, well, it's a puppet television show. And uh, this is one or two guys hanging out on a balcony, uh, always criticizing and making sarcastic jokes about what's going on in the theater. Now, that character, if I was sitting down there, would be a highly playable character, because then I could make, be, be making sarcastic jokes about whoever was standing up here. <laughs> standing up here, though, it is not a very playable character. Also, if you've seen The Muppet Show, you'll know that this guy always goes together with another guy, another old man, always mocking, making sarcastic jokes, and they laugh at each other's jokes. Now, without the other guy around to laugh at my jokes, that character becomes more difficult to play. So, before I truly start, uh, I want you all to repeat after me. Okay? Can, can we do that? If I say, hello, can you all say hello? Hello! hello. Yes. Nothing is true. Nothing is true. Everything is permissible. Everything is permissible. I will not obey authority. I will not obey authority. I will not repeat what the lecturer says. I will not repeat what the lecturer says. I will not repeat what the lecturer says. I will not repeat. Bad pattern. Good everybody else. Okay, so I'm going to talk about characters and character design. And there are two things really worth knowing about character design um, for LARPs. One is, in most LARP projects, it is what takes up the most time. That is everything else. Uh, scenography, logistics, economy, discussing the concept, uh, costumes even, actually ends, usually ends up taking less time than the monumental task of figuring out what everybody is going to play. It's not true of every single LARP, but it's most often the case. So character writing, character design is important. It's a really big part of what you do in love design. But it's also very, very variable. What constitutes a good character varies from LARP to LARP. It varies from group to group. It varies from cu culture to culture. Uh, and it varies all over the world. There's a lot of individual style here. I write different characters than the people I often work with. Uh, so it's one of the areas where um, we're really talking about LARP design as an art, and definitely not as an engineering. So there's almost nothing here that's entirely right, and there's almost nothing that's entirely wrong. Still, I will present to you some thumbnail rules, some guidelines, some generally true things, and the reason I made you all say nothing is true, everything is permissible, is to remember that there are no, none of these rules come without exceptions. A character. What is a character? Nothing deep to philosophical here. It's whoever you pretend to be when you're role-playing. And then we use the word in actually several different meanings. Because when doing log design, we also refer to character as the stuff, the way we tell the player who they're going to pretend to be. So this A4 paper with text, that's a character. But me running around pretending to be the person described on that text for a week is also a character. And I'll be using the word in both of these meanings, and it generally works out fine. Now, this guy here, this is a character. Uh, he's at uh, a lot I was part of the design team for, a Norwegian moth, weird mafia musical thing. Uh, his character is called the Belgian chimpanzee. Uh, the character is a chimpanzee from Belgium, uh, who somehow has ended, ended up in this Norwegian town and hangs out with the mafia. <coughs> and in addition, he can never lose a drinking competition or any other kind of contest of, contest of fortitude. That's pretty much what the player knows about the Belgian chimpanzee when the game starts. So, here's our first Belgian chimpanzee. Uh, and he took this, uh, the unbeatable chimpanzee, uh, as well as the bit like the aggressive chimpanzee language, uh, and made a lot of that, out of that in his character. So he walked around, was rather intimidating, and kept on winning drinking competitions. <laughs> now here to the left we have another, another Belgian chimpanzee. A chimpanzee from Belgium. What on earth is that? There's a, bit, there's a bit of mystery here. How come he always wins drinking competitions? Enter the dark sunglasses, the top hat, and in addition, for no apparent reason, he always walked around barefoot. The mysterious Belgian chimpanzee. This is the same game, but run again with different players. And here, sitting on the table, we have a third Belgian chimpanzee. Uh, another one of the game, this time played by a girl. 
Uh, and while she did talk uh, and interact with human beings, she would constantly be like, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> and that's why you can see she's not sitting, she's standing on the chair, because Walt's self-respecting chimpanzee would actually sit down. Uh, she also entered in some card games and kept on winning there, so by the end of this particular round of luck, it was very clear that she had some kind of superhuman godly luck, um, which she then dealt with in a very chimpanzee animalish way. Now, which of these three versions of the Belgian chimpanzee are the Belgian chimpanzee we the organizers wanted? The truth is all of them. All of these, uh, all of these players interpreted the character in such a way that it gave something interesting to the rest of the lore. They played on the thing that, this, uh, that we had one character who couldn't lose a drinking competition, which gave a lot of play to the other players, uh, <laughs> and they made the lot richer. Uh, and for every single time we play a character, we are not playing the exact same characters the organizers have envisioned, we are playing a character interpretation. And that's okay, but it's also worth keeping in mind when designing characters that players will interpret them. There is always a risk they will interpret them wrongly, and we can reduce that risk but they will never be exactly our piece of A4 paper or our verbal instructions. Must the character be playable? Oh, well, you would think this is a trick question, and the answer is yes, but uh, the answer is actually, uh, it depends. Like, let's, yesterday we heard about Carpo, uh, and we heard about Prisoner for a Day. Now, at Carpo, you definitely need a playable character, because you're going to run around for up to 48 hours, pretending to be this character. And inside of the play area, there are no organizers. It's, everything is left up to the players and the society they are enacting, the people they are pretending to be. And if they can't play their characters, then Carpo falls to pieces. There is no Carpo. But Prisoner for a Day, which is of a very similar setup, uh, has kind of organizer characters going in as prison guards and uh, bureaucrats and so on, ordering people around. Now, I'm not saying that it's not good to have playable characters at a, at a lot like Prisoner for a Day, but it's not very important, because whether you can figure out how to play this character or not, they're still going to be bossing you around, and they're still going to ask you to stand for one hour over there and stare at the wall, and they're still going to order you to have your hair cut for uh, flea removal. And it doesn't matter whether you're able to role-play or not, you're still getting the experience. So, when you need player in, uh, playable characters is when you need player initiative. The players can go around a lot, initiating events, role-playing consistently, driving the game. And initiative, it could be, I mean, it could be a slider of its own, because some games are entirely reliant on, okay, we throw all the players in here, and give them characters, and then we leave and lock the door and see what they make out of it. While others are, have greater degrees of control. And hence, the question of how important are the characters varies. Are all characters playable? We do interpret them, after all. No. I said nothing is true, everything is permissible, but I can give you some examples of characters that uh, are not very playable. I'll start with one of my own. Not a character I wrote from somebody else. A character I wrote for myself to play at a Swedish game last autumn. Um, the character I'd envisioned was some kind of financial psychopath. He was moving money around on the stock markets all the time, he was getting very, very rich, and he really had no respect for uh, human dignity life or whatever, so it, to his mind, everybody else was just a tool, just as the numbers on his screen. I wanted to play a kind of nasty person. But then on the bus road over to Stockholm, no, on the uh, car trip over to Stockholm, I keep changing the character. I'm a bit tired, I know I can't really play very slick. And besides, this character has been through the financial crisis where he probably lost everything. So I decided to play this like basically unsympathetic person, but who is also run down, depressed, reluctant. And then we arrive in Stockholm, and the group I travelled with disperses to different directions, and there are a hundred different characters over there, uh, around here, and to be able to enjoy this laugh, I have to hook up with someone. And I'm basically a really unsympathetic and also depressed person. <laughs> Didn't work. <laughs> I spent a lot of time like walking around, like, looking at people and trying to, trying to make little conversations in the cafes and so on, trying to see if, fish if there was anything there I could make money of. And that kind of turns people off. You know. uh, which brings me to the second point. Designing characters is not something we are doing as 
organizers. We are also doing this as players. The slider shows like to, to what degree. Uh, but character design skills is something we also need as players whenever we go to the logs that expect us to make up a large piece of the character ourselves. Unplayable characters are invisible to the other characters. I'll give you a very good example of a very popular unplayable character in the Scandinavian fantasy logs. That character is Aragorn, son of Araton, a free ranger of the north, uh, taken straight out of Lord of the Rings. Now the thing with Aragorn is that he becomes an incredibly interesting person during the, during the story of Lord of the Rings. But at first, he's just a weird, mysterious guy who sits in the corner of the inn and stares at people and doesn't really talk to them. And that's the unplayable character. And it's quite popular for people to request, I want to play the weird, mysterious, black-clad guy who hangs in the corner of the inn and stares at people. And secretly, secretly, <laughs> I am a hero, a prince, or a dark lord or whatever. But the thing is, if at a lot of people are constantly looking around, they're constantly trying to pick up on signals. It's, Does anyone want to play with me? Is anything happening now? And the guy in the corner with a pipe gets ignored very quickly. He might have a good audience experience, a spectator experience. Probably it's very fun. But the character contributes nothing to the game, and the player gets nothing out of the game, except from, for the joy of watching it. Unplayable characters are also the ones that make you uncertain or insecure of how to play them. I'll give you another example. There was a, this is the biggest character I've ever seen. It was like 20 pages of character text for a law project uh, that I joined. And it was about uh, the greatest hero of the game. This was a game about heroism and about uh, adventure. And this character was known to everybody else in society as, uh, let's call him Rex, the greatest hero. And, and the, the character didn't even say, the front page didn't even say character. It said, uh, the epic tale of Rex. And then it goes on for 19 pages about all the great deeds that Rex has done. He has defeated dragons. He has bewitched witches. Uh, and it goes on and on about all the great deeds and great rewards. And on page 19, Rex dies. <laughs> on page 20, it turns out that his assistant, his page, uh, who has been popping up in the story a few times so far, uh, in order not to disappoint people, because everybody loved Rex, and they would be sad if Rex was no longer here, um, then, uh, in order not to disappoint, disappoint them, he puts on Rex's armor and goes around pretending to be Rex. Oh my god. <laughs> now the question for the player who receives this character is, how on earth am I going to pull this off? Because either I have to, either it has to be revealed very early on that I am not Rex, like the moment I meet everybody else, uh, or I have to go around being a role player, pretending to be a role player, pretending to be Rex. It could be cleared up. There could be two more pages uh, explaining, um, explaining how, this is how we want you to play. This is why we want this character to be there. In this case, there was not. As a player, it would be fundamentally insecure about how to play this character. You can also play a character. like uh, You can uh, be Sauron, the dark lord of evil, the dark lord of Morgendor. And then you're getting this character, and you're going to a model United Nations. <laughs> What's the point? Or you could lack things to do at the LARP. You can go to the model United Nations. If you have a very plausible character as uh, the, um, uh, as the uh, Minister of Culture for one of the co countries. But this model United Nations is about uh, nuclear disarmament. What on earth do you need a Minister for Culture for? What is he doing in the, in the LARP? Do, do that. <laughs> <laughs> It can be based on untrue or unrealistic assumptions of your playstyle. I once got a character. Uh, I once got a character that was uh, described as a, a handsome, dashing old aristocrat who was always flirting and charming the ladies. The problem is, I'm not very good at flirting and charming the ladies. I really had a hard time pulling this character off, and I would have been a lot happier if I got another character who was less popular with the ladies. <laughs> or it could be based on untrue, unrealistic assumptions of my co-player's playstyle. Let's say I have managed to pull off this charming old dashing aristocrat and uh, none of the female players have any interest in playing on flirting or romance. My character falls through. It becomes unplayable. So what is a playable character? Well, obviously it's the opposite of all these. They're visible to the other characters. They're not hiding in the corner. 
it's clear, they are clear about how you play them. They have a hook into the group, the LARP, the, what's going on. They have things to do with the LARP, they fit my playstyle, and uh, they fit the playstyle of my co-players, so they're able to respond on what I as a player have to give. Or to summarize in three words, we need a character that has clarity, so that I the player feel confident about how to play it. We need a character that has activities, something to do at the LARP. And we need a character that has connectivity, that has a place in the group and society of the LARP. I tried to write down everything. I, I can share my slides afterwards. Okay, continuing. First, let's talk about clarity, and this will be my longest section. Now, as a player going into a LARP, I am insecure. I am confused. Okay, is there anyone here who, when attending their first LARP, was not confused and a little bit afraid of will I play it wrong? Anyone here who didn't? I, I don't believe you. <laughs> or more like, the mo uh, usually when you're on a LARP, you can assume that players are a bit insecure about how are we going to roleplay. And roleplaying happens as people overcome their insecurities, as they begin looking at how other people are roleplaying and adopt the same behaviors themselves. <coughs> so, an important task for the game designer is to, do, to do write characters, communicate characters in such a way that you reduce insecurity and make it absolutely <coughs> crystal clear for the player how they're going to play. However, there are a number of different ways of doing this, and I'll be showing you some examples now. Here's a character, Ronald McGregor. Ronald McGregor is a detective. In some games, this is all the character you need. First of all, detective. Anyone who's read a crime novel or seen a crime, uh, a crime movie or a murder mystery or something has an idea of like who the detective, what kind of person a detective might be. It's easy to pick up and it's easy to play. Especially if the rest of, uh, if the, rest of the group there are also characters that fit into this kind of universe. So it might not be necessary to write anything more, more than that. I mean, in, in uh, Let Our Destinies Meet, uh, the, the position of the one keyword is often all you have to build your character on. And it still kind of works, but it doesn't become the same lob every time. It's a very unpredictable thing. So if you want more predictability, you need more than this. Now, we can supply Ronald McGregor with a motivation. Why would he want to solve crimes? Okay, he's alcoholic. He really needs a job now, because he's been drinking up all his money and uh, he doesn't have enough for rent, so he'll be homeless. And he's also established a bit more what kind of person he is. Or we can begin describing him in other terms, rather than the straightforward fact. A man who always sits in a slouched posture, nervously fiddles with a cigarette he never lights, and often clenches a whiskey glass in his other hand. He keeps staring curiously at little details other people miss, asks inquisitive questions, <coughs> as if he always, <coughs> is always trying to put together pieces of a puzzle. Now, I might not need to actually write that Robin McGregor is a detective, because if the player follows these instructions, and all these instructions are very easy to follow, they're very physical, he will be filling the role in the game that I need. Then I'll take you to another game very briefly, Love in the Age of the Basement. It's a game about that lasts like about an hour or two. It's about six couples meeting in a cafe in the midst of a relationship crisis. So during the game, they end up either breaking up or not breaking up. And the characters, I won't show you a character because they're too long, but they're written in a flow of consciousness way. They show you how your character thinks. If we apply this way of writing to our detective here, it would look like this. Ashtray flavored whiskey rolling down my throat. Beat, dub, beat, yeah. Forget them unpaid bills. No use thinking of them. No use drinking, no use, no use not drinking. Solve the crime. Win the dame. Dub, beat, dub. Staring at a thing that doesn't make sense. Asking them the questions they don't want asked. What do I care? What should I care? Just a PI man. And the thing with this kind of the thing with this kind of text is as you read it inside your mind, actually I did it wrong now by reading it out aloud, 
As you read it inside your mind, you get an idea of the character's inner monologue. This is something that you as a player can use during the game. Now, when we started discussing what is a playable character uh, yesterday, um, people kept telling me about the things they do when they're not interacting with other people. Because there are times in LARP when you're not interacting with people. Uh, and one person said that, well, first of all, she has a song connected to the character that she hums. And secondly, she has a childhood memory, something that she can think of when not interacting with other people. And this kind of thought, flow of thought way of writing a character also gives you something to think of. And in addition, it communicates information. Reading this, we already know quite a bit of what kind of person Ronald McGregor is, and what he cares about, and what his current troubles are. It's a bit fuzzy, but if the game isn't requ doesn't require me to be very precise, if I'm not dependent on communicating here that Ronald McDonald owes money, then it's fine. Another way we can go about communicating things is by pictures. Yeah. Ronald McGregor. Do we need more of a character than this? I see this, I know, okay, this is the archetype I'm going to play. I need a hat and a cigarette. And he's probably a detective. Or we can forget everything about Ronald McGregor. We can begin looking at who he interacts with. So he works at McGregor's detective agency. Okay, we don't need to write a detective. He works in a detective agency, clear enough. And he has a secretary. Aha, he has another player who can meet me before the game. And agree, okay, I'm, I'm the detective, you're the secretary. What's our relationship like? He's a member of Alcoholics Anonymous with uh, three other characters. Okay, I can, I can talk to them and we can figure out what's, what's our group like. But inactive, uh-oh. <laughs> He's married to Lisa Pretty McGregor. Okay, somebody has a nickname Pretty. That always already tells us something about her. Divorced, no children. Hmm, what happened there? This is something we can pick up on and develop. And pays rent to Anna Lafaul. Okay, now I know who my opponent is. <laughs> Introduce yet another game, just very briefly. This was the venue of A Quiet Evening with the Family, uh, played in 2006, I think which was the first lob to entirely use theater scripts as its basis. There were scripts by Ibsen, there were scripts by Strindberg, uh, there were scripts, scripts by Winterberg, and by one whose name I forget. Löffler. Le and Tobi also. Yeah. So there was both Ibsen's very pompous bourgeois characters, and there was the Boomin family. Mm -hmm. uh, and for this game, uh, for example, I, I got cast as a character of Dr. Gank in A Doll's House, um, played by Ibsen. And before the LARP begins, we sit down and we read through the doll's house together. I read the lines of Dr. Dunk, the other players read the lines of their characters, just as we would if we were going to begin working on a theatre performance. But we're not working on a the theatre performance. The day after the LARP starts, no way can we memorise all these lines. You know? But we've talked through, okay, uh, how can we make this happen during the game? Uh, the, the basic points of a doll's house. And then we go about role-playing, improvising. And sometimes, sometimes you remember a line from the, from the script, and sometimes a co-player remembers a line as well, and it's fitting, it works in the conversation, it's magical, but it, this doesn't have to happen. I personally think this is maybe the very best way of writing characters. It's also very imprecise, because you communicate very clearly who a character is by dialogue, but it's very difficult to communicate through that dialogue what you need of the player to do in the game. Also, you need to be good at writing dialogue. And those of us who have worked a bit of writing know that dialogue can be bloody tricky. But if you try to follow this, this way of writing, we could write Ronald McGregor's character like this. As a dialogue. Now we have uh, Ronald and Lady Winterfield talk, talking. Are you a detective? Who is asking? One of the wealthiest women in all of Britain. In that case, ma'am, yes, I am a detective. Are you any good? <laughs> and you know, these are, these are six lines, and with those six lines we've established quite a bit about both the character of Ronald and the character of Lady Winterfield. And this might be all we need in order to get the LARP to work, uh, to distribute pieces of dialogue. Maybe stuff that happened before the LARP, maybe this was a month ago, and the LARP is about, uh, is about the final meeting between Ronald and Winterfield. Or it could be the dialogue that opens the game. <coughs> 
but it's, it very clearly, very quickly establishes character and it has an additional advantage. I, as a player, now have a language to use when playing my character. I now, now know what kind of words Ronald McGregor uses. I know how he reacts and all of this very quickly. Now those were some examples of character writing. I'll return to one final example at the end of my presentation here. But in general, tricks for achieving clarity. Both facts and emotions are good. The fact is that Ronald McGregor works at a detective agency and he solves crimes. But the fact is also that he feels a bit miserable, he drinks a lot. And some of this emotional content is important for my role playing, but isn't able, but I'm not able to communicate it clearly as a fact. So a clear character is not necessarily one that's written as a bullet pointed list, or one that I think of as merely the facts. Use a style that works the best for you and the LARP. Now I showed you six different ways of writing Ronald McGregor, but these six different ways would work differently at six different LARPs. In some ways, they fit into six different genres. There's no automatic <coughs> best way of writing a character. It depends on the LARP, and it creates the LARP. Considering the inner monologue, how do I play the character when I'm not moving and not talking? What's going on in my mind? Stereotypes make for easy playability. And if I have a very short lot, if I'm going to play for half an hour, an hour, maybe all I need is like, you're the burly detective. Okay, I'm a burly detective. That's enough. I'll play this for an hour. But then the lot goes on for five days, and being the burly detective is no longer enough. Also, during that one, that one hour, something might happen where, which isn't covered by the burly detective. What happens when the burly detective falls in love? That's not entirely clear from a stereotype. I need more depth. And one of the ways we can add more depth to characters is by adding dissonance, by adding con contradictions or semi-contradictions or things that just don't fit into the stereotypes. You're the proud, responsible, caring, loving father of the family. I imagine like a, a bearded guy with lots of te teddy bears who plays games with his children and so on. But then I end the sentence. But you have a hard time controlling your anger. So I'm the still a kind, caring father. But then a kid bumps into a glass and it falls into the ground and it smashes and I get furious! Oops. And my cry does not allow me to apologize for the things I regret. Okay. Immediately we have an internal conflict. We have more to play on. And we have a tension that can continue to develop during the game. Or I'm the happy troubadour. The musician, the singer, the joke teller. Hello. I'll make you all happy. I can do this for an hour, no problem. But, it's, but if I'm going to do it for four hours or a day, maybe I need something more. Something to do when I'm not able to be happy and joyful. And so I'm still recovering from the death of my true love, Ace Boy. These are just a couple of examples. Uh, but I think any character that, needs, that is supposed to be so, somewhat deep and be played for some uh, length of time cannot be one-dimensional. They must have more than one dimension so that you can continue exploring the character through roleplay. Because characters are human beings, and human beings are not stereotypes. Or, to be more correct, characters are living beings, because you can be a dog. And, but if you play a door, that door is transformed into a living door. <laughs> a few words on activity. How do I get something to do at the game? What do I do normally? I mean, I'm a detective, I solve crimes, right? Okay, is there a crime at the game? Is it going to be a murder? Because if not, maybe it's not very interesting to play the detective. If I'm the detective at the UN climate conference, I have nothing to do. It doesn't matter that I'm the world's coolest detective, and that I have a great inner monologue uh, in my mind, and that I have depth and complexity in the character. If I'm a doctor, people might get hurt like in character. Okay, suddenly I'm useful. If I'm a construction worker, that's something I can play of. I'm a construction worker. I work hard and I drink hard. It's a character, but it doesn't give me anything to do at the game. So that also needs to be something for the organizers to think about. Because very often we have some characters, doctors, priests, lawyers, stuff like that, which very easily get involved in stuff in the game in, in the capacity of their profession. And other characters who do not. 
So if I write 10 characters, and there's a doctor and a nurse, and a specialist on Egyptian hieroglyphs, uh, and then seven people with interesting professions, but that do not apply to the game, then I've not written 10 equal characters, then I've written three characters that so far have something to do, and seven that do not. I need something more for the other seven. And on the other, on the other hand, uh, if, I have, uh, if I've written a character like, uh, like the doctor, who has like a bunch of a lot of medicine, and there's a lot where like lots of people are going to die and get sick and, and, and stuff like that. And people are shouting for the doctor all the time. And then playing the doctor might actually be a bit overwhelming because you have too much to do. You know, maybe you need three doctors, or maybe you need to say, "You, the doctor, did not bring your medicine. You can do very little." What does the character do when things change? Because very often the LARP is about the transformation. You start somewhere which is more or less normal life, and something happens, and now we're not in normal life any longer. We were loving brothers and sisters, but now we're going to di divide up the inheritance. We were neighbors, we didn't know each other that well, and suddenly the police have all put us in a cell. So knowing a lot about what kind of neighbor I am, it does help me to establish some relationships to the other characters, it does help me to get started but it doesn't tell me how to play once we're in the police zone. Is there a potential in the character for learning new behavior? There's always a temptation of writing characters that are kind of very static. You are so and so. You are the old man, you complain about, uh, you complain about little children. And you don't like people. Okay, so the zombies invade. I don't like people, what am I going to do now? So, if I know as a designer that, the LARP is, that lots of stuff is going to happen during the LARP, it's often a good idea to think about this when we're writing the characters. Not about who they were, but about who they are likely to be during the game. If the LARP is about talking, if it's the model United Nations, does the character talk? We'll be doing a lot of talking. What is my language? How do I argue? How do I respond to discussion? These might be things that are a good idea to help the player flesh out. <coughs> In what tone? Easiest one of acting, so just to change your voice a little bit. Immediately you're in character. We can help the players do that. If the LARP is about fighting, I might not need to care about what, enough, what kind of voice my character has, or how he argues, how he discusses. But then I really, know, really need to know, okay, the zombies invade. Is my character a pacifist who would never raise a weapon even against an evil undead zombie? How do I behave in the battle? This suddenly becomes relevant information. And again, it all depends on the LARP, which is the hard thing about saying anything that's kind of generally true about LARPs. It all depends a bit on the LARP. A bit then about connectivity. How do players connect to each other? How do they fit into groups and societies and so on? Uh, before I talk about groups and societies and so on, I'll just show you this handsome fella here. Now, <clears throat> you're a player at the LARP and you walk into the forest and you meet him. What does he invite you to do? Run yeah. away. Bye. Yeah. So you're a medieval farmer, and you meet him in the forest, and you run as fast as you can, right? <coughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But what if you are uh, you're a medieval knight, the bravest, boldest knight in the village? Fight. <laughs> you're a young orc maiden, looking for a decent enough orc uh, to marry and then beat up. <laughs> and the point is that mainly, mainly by kind of putting on the character, maybe by saying to the Lord that I am an orc, I am a doctor, I am a priest, you are telling other people how they can react to you. And you're also getting uh, access to different ways of interacting with the other characters. Now, the option of fighting this orc is only available if I, am, if I am a knight and if I have a sword. The option of hugging him is only available if I'm, if I'm another orc, or if I'm a really, really stupid. Uh, and so these affordances of characters are basically, if you get those right, 
if the characters clearly are available to each other in different ways. You don't need that much else. That's the foundation. Then the relationships create themselves. A typical example of, of a character who has a lot of affordances is one we also had in this Mafia musical game, the, uh, uh, the priest. I think Fo Martin has played the priest at one, at one point. Yeah. Uh, the exact function of the priest varies a bit from game to game. But one game we said, uh, okay, uh, all of you people here have probably confessed to the priest at some point. And that what happened during the game was that people uh, who didn't have anything to play on right now, they went over to the priest to confess. And also, the priest could go over to anyone and put his hand on their shoulder and say, my child, how does it go with your problems, with, with your problematic family life, and so on. Immediately we created access in both ways. People had a reason to interact with the priest, and the priest had a reason to interact with everyone. But we also had characters in that game uh, which didn't have a very strong reason to interact with anyone. We had one character who was the grumpy old woman who really owned the basement where this mafia was hanging out and uh, who kept insisting that by tomorrow at 12 o'clock I don't want to see a single drop of blood on the floor. And there's limited the possibilities for interacting with this character because you don't want to get in trouble with the landlady. Uh, and she also has limited uh, possibilities for interacting with other players. So that turned out to be one of the more difficult characters to play and very dependent upon the player's character interpretation. So, we need a reason to interact with other characters, something we can see clearly. I, uh, I am the priest, I uh, should take care of my own. And we need other play players to have a reason to interact with me. Which again shows how Aragorn in the corner is such an unplayable character. <coughs> And then I will not talk very much about relationships and social structure in this talk, partially because it's such a huge thing and because it varies so much from lot to lot. But relationships can really define lot. So as an example where we saw the detective McGregor and his relationships to the Alcoholics <coughs> Anonymous, to his ex-wife, and so on, these things give people lots of things to play on. But a relationship or emo emotion is not necessarily enough. Uh, somebody pointed out yesterday that they had received characters with a, with a relationship that you have a crush on someone. And this is not necessarily enough to play on. It doesn't necessarily create action. A relationship needs to be something you can act on during the game. Okay, this is my co-detective. Obviously we have something to talk about and do. One of us gets a job or sees a murderer. We both have something to do. Uh, this is uh, my landlady. We have a limited space of interaction. If I only have a relationship to my landlady, I might not have enough of a position in this lot. Because my landlady only, only cares about getting the money from me. She doesn't care about anything else. I've seen in some lot design circles a tendency to look at the quantity of relationships or plots. And for example, okay, we need to make sure that every single character has at least two relationships to some, or connection to some other character of the game. And this does not work. It does not work to ensure that everybody has enough to play on. Because what how much play opportunity does a relationship have? Now, in the case of the priest, he who has heard everybody's confessions and who everybody goes to, to confess to, he doesn't need more relationships than the fact that he is the priest. But in case of the kid at the lock, and there are no other children around, and they also don't care much about children, he needs a lot of relationships. Like, yeah, you stole an apple from that guy. That guy used to come over and be your babysitter. Uh, and so on, in order to be, have meaningful interactions with people. So when designing relationships at law, it's really about the quality, never the quantity. Now, in order to drive a story, characters might have various things. <coughs> they may have goals and motivations. Goals is like, do X, or you want to do X. You want to, uh, you want to uh, solve the crime. Goals are dangerous because once the goal becomes unobtainable, or once the goal is obtained, you no longer have anything to do. Okay, the LARP has lasted one hour and it's going to be played for three hours more. I just solved the murder! Yay! Now what? So in addition, uh, I often need a motivation. Why do I want to solve the murder? I really take pride in solving stuff. I'm a very curious person. I really want to know everybody's dirty laundry. And I need money all the time, always more money, because I drink it all up. 
Okay, now I have something to play in for the remaining three hours of the game. Because I know I need money, I know I'm inquisitive, I look at people's private lives, and whatever happens at the rest of the I can play on those things. Or, your goal is to kill the king. Fine. Somebody else goes off and kills the king. Whoops. Now what? Okay, your goal was to kill the king because you want a chance to be the next king. Okay, somebody else has killed the king and is now declaring himself the next king. I have plenty to play on. I need to claim the throne now. You want to kill the king because you are an anarchist. You want there to be no authority. You really despise authority. Okay, I kill the king and somebody else jumps up and says, I am the king. And then I have another king to kill, and another, and so on. And if we manage to get rid of all the kings, then I have a society to try to organize. So I always have goals with the motivations, the reasons we're pursuing them. And make sure you have something to do as a character when the goal fails or is completed. You can have conflicts with other characters. A conflict can be created by two goals, goals that are at odds. I want to kill the king and the king wants to stay alive. Okay, we have a conflict. It's a pretty clear and simple. <laughs> they can also be written more in a, a static thing, like uh, the family Anderson over here has never liked the family Carlson, the family Carlson over there has never liked the family Anderson. So when, when they happen to meet each other on the holiday, then things are going to happen. There's this mutual dislike and their hotel rooms are right next to each other. Okay, we have a conflict. Something's going to happen. Conflicts are dangerous tools. Because if they are resolved too easily, too quickly, then the game runs out of steam. Okay, so the family Anderson is a family of psychopaths, and they have brought all their guns with them. And they meet the neighbor family, and they kill them all, lop over. <laughs> Not interesting. <laughs> no, no. Th these families are ordinary citizens. They would never dream of, of doing anything dramatic. They would, wouldn't, perhaps wouldn't even dream to, of, of bribing the hotel to set up these guys in another room. They always have to smile and be polite and hide their differences, but they're there all the time. And whenever the door is closed and the other family isn't around, then you hear it, all oh, those bloody costs. Now this makes for an interesting conflict. It's subdued, it can keep on sustaining play for hours and days. Characters may have puzzles to solve. I'm not a big fan of puzzles, but it is one of the standard... It's a pretty standard part of the LARP design of toolbox. A puzzle is when, in order to achieve a goal, I need to combine several different things. I need to know all five pieces of information about the murder weapon, the time, the location, and the fact that the butler was lying in order to solve the murder. If I have only three of those, I haven't solved the murder. I need to have the five holy elf stones that will combine to save the world from the evil demon in the Great Ritual, before the Great Ritual on Saturday night. I have a puzzle and it creates several different obstacles. But it can be a way to provide characters with something to do, although often a slightly problematic way. There must have fates or predetermined events, like the, um, the boring family dinner. Uh, it always ends with, uh, with the son leaving. Okay, the son always knows he's going to leave, and this frames the game. You can also have a fate that the dog in the middle of the game must begin barking, and you can have, have another character who says, uh, whose uh, character, another player whose character says, when the dog begins barking, you will stand up and hold your speech. And so these kind of predetermined events can be used to create drama. But these are also difficult tools to work with. Uh, uh, puzzles and fates are complicated tools to work with in a LARP design. Uh, and the bigger the LARP and the longer it lasts, the more complicated they become because the more things can screw up. Secrets are tricky. I'm not saying secrets are wrong, even though I tend to be like uh, on the full transparency side of uh, part of the slider. Secret identity may never be revealed, leading to no role playing. Aragorn in the corner. Or the super spy who pretends to be a farmer. Okay, I'm interacting with other people. I'm, I'm a farmer. I have eggs to sell. I don't want to buy eggs. Okay, I have a role in the, in the game. This might even work. But writing the 12, 19 pages of backstory about how I'm the world's best spy doesn't help. There's no point. Secret communities, you might have them. You might have a faction inside a political system. At 1942, there was illegal po poker game. Illegal, not because the authorities forbid it, but because in this particular Christian community, gambling was seen as very sinful. So the gamblers of the village sneaked into one of, their, one of the basements at night. 
And these secret communities can add uh, drama to the game, but they will need places to meet. Being in the illegal poker game when there is no chance to go to an illegal poker game doesn't help my role playing. It's pointless. Now, I've heard one smart person say, a secret is something only one person knows. In other words, if you have a secret, don't share it. This is not true at Lops. A secret is a cool surprise carried by a character. If it's, if it's never likely to spring into the game, it's not worth much. I'll show you one way of building social structures. This was developed at the 1942 game. It has been used for a number of similar LOPs. It does not fit at every LOP. It wouldn't make sense at the family Anderson. It wouldn't make sense at when our destinies meet. At a lot of LOPs where this wouldn't make sense, but when you're trying to depict a large society, you want to make sure everybody is engaged for the duration of a long LOP. This is a good way to do it. You begin with a character and you ask three questions of this character. What does he work with? He's a fisherman. Is he a soldier? Is he a policeman? And then immediately you have a group. And for this to matter, the work actually needs to be done in, in game. There's no point establishing work bodies so if they are not working in game. You ask the second question who, is, who are his friends? What are their affiliations? Is he in the illegal poker game? Or is he in the, uh, the uh, anti alcohol uh, league? Okay, then we have a group there, combined with the other characters. And this is something that takes place outside of work on the character's free time. But again, these groups need to be relevant, they need to exist, they need to have places to meet and activities to do. And you ask who is the character's family? Is she a mother? Is she a granddaughter? Who are the rest of the family? And again, if they live together, they will interact together. If they make food together, this in itself will help create the family. And by defining these three spheres where it was given character, we have provided them with an identity, a place in society, and stuff to do for five days of warping. As I said, we don't need this for the family Anderson. We don't need this for small short lops. At short lops, we need focus. You only have one, one shot. If a character in the family Anderson is unplayable, uh, there's no time to fix it. You just need a clear instruction, a clear, a clear idea of who the character is, play it now, and you can refine it over time. At long lops, however, I don't need a quick shot, I need depth, I need the, op the opportunity to change my character to adapt to different circumstances. Pursue different play opportunities as a lot changes. Now, I have 10 minutes left, and I'm very close to finishing. I'm now showing you one of the best characters ever written. <laughs> it's from uh, a Norwegian lot. Um, Mad about the boy, which happens in the world where all men have suddenly become extinct. This is not necessarily the best character ever written, but the best character template. I mean, they, they, all the other characters are written in a similar way. They have a picture. These were taken from tarot cards. Tarot cards are full of symbolism. They give you lots of inspiration. They give you an idea of the <coughs> archetype you're going to play. You have up here the archetype. Very briefly. Who is this character? Age, occupation before the disaster, that is when all the men died. Current occupation is of course relevant in this particular game. And this here, this here um, character is a minister. A brief quote, clarify who the character is. Suggested function for the character in the dramaturgy of Rock. The organizers are not letting you guess what they, why they will have this character here and what, what they want you to do. They're writing what they think you should do, what their idea of this character is. Dysfunction, personal issue, has a dissonance. Something that doesn't, uh, doesn't fit with the image my character is trying to project. A goal. And here it says, to make this project such a success, it will leverage to her career goal, Prime Minister. Now the current project is the topic of the LARP, but this character wants to be Prime Minister. No matter how things go at the law, that's still something you can pursue. Antagonist, what does she do for this life? People who refuse to realize that they are a more privileged group than others, and that us should act more humble. A complete character, and these characters are online. You can look through all of them for inspiration. Now, a final thought. This is another law, Andrea Castellani's uh, Romani, Another Life from Scratch. I've been saying like um, 
Okay, characters who, who don't talk, who don't interact with other people, like the Aragon character. That never works. This character here, he has in, is in, in his instruction says, you're introvert, you're shy, you don't like talking to people, and especially you don't like talking to groups. At max, you talk to one person at a time. Unplayable character, I would say so. But it worked in this four-hour game. It's worked in every version of that game. Why? Well, that comes down to the particular particulars of the game. But my point is that all rules have exceptions. And characters can also be workshopped, which I believe we will learn more about in the workshop workshop. Uh, that will come, I think, tomorrow. Yeah, I, th I thought I might demonstrate a bit the workshop stuff, but I don't have time for that, so instead I'll accept a few questions. Thank you. Questions? Come on, yeah. Do you have any good just suggestion on, on how to start creating characters? Should you start with the with the, uh, the relationships? Should you start with the how, how, where to start with creating a character? Even if it's an organized and organized. Okay. Uh, my stupid answer is it depends on the LARP. <laughs> like I'll give you some some examples. Uh, very often, many teams I worked with, we begin with just kind of sketching one liners. Uh, and very often they begin. They again come from like an overarching structure. And we begin with okay, we're going to have like a mafia group here, and we're going to have like uh, we're going to have some smugglers here, and so on. And we begin with the idea that okay, with, with this law has 30 mafia and 10 smugglers. It's really a mafia law, but if it's 20 of each, then there's kind of a competition going on with between the mafia and the smugglers. Is that what we want? Right? We begin with that overarching thing. We write one-liners, but then I mean, the first idea is almost never the best. We keep on writing characters, and suddenly there's like some new ideas that introduce each other themselves just by writing these one-liners. And then suddenly we have like a fourth group and a fifth group, and things are changing. And then um, I'll touch on this in my talk tomorrow, um, creative process. But the key thing in any creative work is hunkering. Hunkering is when okay, I've been writing, or I've been making a sculpture, I've been building stuff. And then I stop doing that, I take a few steps back, and I go like, that's hungry. Trying to lean back, get yourself out of the process for a while, and look at it as a whole. Okay, so when we come up with 20 character concepts, and then we take a break, go out, smoke a cigarette, drink some beer, whatever, and then we come back in again and look at the characters and ask, what kind of lab do we see here? Any more questions? Yes. yes but... um, anything you can say about the, the specific, were there specific elements to the game you mentioned last year that made that inflatable character playable or made it work? Uh, the one, the one I played, the one I played at, or? No, the, the one, the picture with the, the yeah, the, the introvert, which yeah. is the Aragorn character. Yeah. It goes very much down to detail. Uh, one thing was that this game was uh, kitchen sink realism. And it's like very social realism. There's like the, the, the absolutely no whiff of magic or the unusual. It's a family, or it's a dinner amongst family and friends uh, who are Romanian immigrants in Italy. Uh, so there's like a, a social critique dimension in it as well. Uh, and you're not really, you're not supposed to play this dinner as the one where everything goes go gone. It's low key. So it's perhaps easier to play an introvert character in this setting as one of eight people around the table. Uh, because then everybody else going blah, 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 and then actually the absent, the, the, the one sitting in the chair and not talking, becomes a member of the group still. It's noticeable. And when he does talk, he turns around and looks at one person, talks to that person, and ignores all the rest. This too is noticeable. Additionally, uh, this lop used uh, actually the theater, a bit of the theater way of writing characters. I mean, we had a written character, but we also, as part of the preparations for the game, uh, played certain scenes that were pre-written by the uh, author, Andrea Castellani. So with this character, the introvert character, uh, there were like three scenes played between him and various friends that were, were all similar instructions that you go on talking and he sits there listening and he says one word. So they spent a lot of time establishing this character in people's life as like an old friend and, and as a normal thing. Yeah. So 
Yeah. So he might not be, he's, he's the introvert and he doesn't want to necessarily reach out because people are reaching for him. Yeah. Or well, people were also in a way used to not reaching so much for him, but he was still connected. He had a seat at the table. But I think if you took this family and threw it into a bigger lot, where with more confusion, it would very qu quickly disappear. They would forget about him. Let's see, I think, can you have a quick one? <coughs> and then one? Yeah, it's, you need to, to in, in some way, give the other players the initiative of including this person in some way. It doesn't mean that you have to talk to him all the time. At a fantasy lot where you have the Aragorn character, then you have to have someone else really wanting to get information from him, or uh, wanting his help, or being in love with him, or whatever. Uh, you can do different things with the other characters that will include this person in some way. But you have to do that if you want to come in. Yeah, so um, sort of to summarize that, you could say that like using transparency and using connectivity, you can still make a separated introvert Aragorn character playable. Yeah. In a sense, but again, okay. it depends, sense, but it yeah, depends on the lot. Yeah. So I think the, the thing with the kind of unplayable characters is that it's, uh, they are not necessarily things you must always avoid, but they are things you must always treat carefully. So if you come up with, a, okay, let's have a character who's an introvert and doesn't have a reason to interact with other people then know that this is problematic and see what can be done to make it work anyway. Yeah. Uh, I believe I'm out of time. Um, so, okay, I'll, I'll accept two last questions. I have two minutes, I see, so. Two last questions and then it's over. Yeah. Magna first and then, yeah. Uh, yeah. You said when making death, you can do it by creating like uh, a contradiction in the character. Mm -hmm. Uh, another way to do it is to create an issue, an inner, inner struggle for the character. So mm -hmm. it will be interesting to play the character to see if he will overcome his fear of rejection or stuff like that as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, I agree. But it also depends a lot on you, the player, uh, being able to carry out that inner monologue. Yeah. yeah. Also, uh, I would like to ask uh, if you had experience, uh, maybe heard of uh, cases and some advices on how to deal with uh, people who whose profession in real life connected to the character which you wish to give them. Mm. For example, you, they work in the foreign ministry, Mr. Foreign Affairs, and you want to model this, uh, like, uh, 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 s s some kind of ministry, and you know that they will be falling out because you won't be able to model all the aspects of bureaucracy or something. Yeah. It's a challenge for both you, the designer, and for the player. Because if the player is willing to accept that, okay, this, this law uh, is a model United Nations, it's not a real United Nations. So even if you are a United Nations diplomat, things will not work the way you expect them to. Uh, if the player is willing to accept that, then his knowledge of the real United States, Nations can be a big benefit to the game. But if the character refuses to accept that, um, and you cast him as like, the, then you need to maybe cast him as a head of the United Nations, Secretary General, something like that some character who is in a position of authority to tell other characters about how this stuff is supposed to work. Same thing if you have like a real doctor and uh, a hospital lab, then you put the, the real doctor as kind of the teacher of the regular doctors. So he has an in-game license to correct people. But the best is, I mean, we, we can never read up on all the information needed to play plausibly in a lab. It's not possible to educate people as doctors to play doctors, and it's pointless. So any, anyone entering a LARP must accept kind of some reduction of accuracy. Yeah, I'm sorry, my okay. Very last, time's okay, up. If I could comment on that one is that you also risk having like a B movie with an A-list actor effect. That if you have like uh, Jeremy Irons cast in Dungeons and Dragons movie and all the rest of us are crappy people that don't know how to be doctors, and then you have one person really doing it well, that will make the rest of the people playing with that person uh, seem bad. Even though we're doing our best, I don't know how to say stat ASAP at the right time. And that could break the illusion. And sometimes it's for even if everybody is playing stuff they don't know about. So detective stories close okay. to investigators. Okay, um, good point, but uh, my time is up. Thank you very much for listening.
Um, we will very shortly have a design break and a pitch forum, but this time we will do it a little bit different. So we will divide you into three workshops. And can uh, those of you who played the Boring Family game with Arlan as the facilitator in the room on that side, can you please raise your hand? Okay, so... Uh, only nine people? Group three, and then I am. I am Alan. Can you come up, Alan? Yeah. Those who were playing Boring Family Dinner with him in that room. Yeah. <laughs> okay, excellent. So please, please, please keep it up. We are just making a group division now. So. Okay, those who sit in one of the first three rows that have raised your hands now, you will go here to the stage after the break. Those who raised your hands uh, that uh, are on the back part of the room, you are going to the room over there. 